You're listening to the Trailblazers Podcast, episode 87 with Steve Vassar. You're listening to the Trailblazers Podcast, where we will explore the stories of successful Black professionals. Join us as we highlight the knowledge, resources, and tools of these accomplished trailblazers to help provide the know-how, confidence, and motivation you need to blaze your trail. And now, here's your host, Stephen Hart. What's up, Blaze Nation? We've got a really dope conversation for you today. Our guest is Steve Vassor. He's the director for the campaign for Black Male Achievements, Rumble, Young Man Rumble. Steve is a proud dad, husband. He's a mentor and coach, a man of faith and action. He's a sought-after speaker and facilitator. And guys, today's episode is pure fire. Steve opens up about his backstory we talk about. What's driving him in the work he's doing with CBMA today? And he gets into defining this amazing acronym for the word CLIMB. And he shares what it means to climb ladders, rocks, and trees. You don't want to miss this. We also talked about masculinity and what it means as a black man. What it means to be a man today. A black man today. Guys, this and so much more awaits you in today's episode I encourage you to go ahead and click the share icon in your podcast app. Share this out right now on Twitter or take a snapshot and share this episode in an IG story. If you do, be sure to tag us up so I can say thank you. My handle is at TBPod or at Steve Nahart. Before we get into today's conversation, though, with Steve, I wanted to give a shout out to one of our listeners, RF1876 on Apple Podcasts, who left us this awesome review that reads, people often complain about having access to mentors. Once you realize that mentorship can take many forms and that mentors don't necessarily have to be aware of you, there's an abundance of information out there for you to access. You just need to be open to receive. This podcast is great for anyone, regardless of where he or she is in the journey. Quality production, excellent guests, powerful message, and a powerful intention. I listen regularly as part of my motivation routine. Steven says it best when he calls it Mission Fuel. Thank you so much for that amazing review and for these kind words, RF1876. Blazer Nation, if you've not yet had a chance to do so, please consider leaving us a review over on Apple Podcasts. I'm learning a ton about who you are by seeing these new reviews pop up every couple of weeks. And I just enjoy reading them and sharing them with our community. So please continue to leave us your five-star review over on Apple Podcasts. We'll also continue giving shout-outs more frequently for some of these amazing reviews. Guys, the full show notes for today's episode can be found over at tbpod.com. And that's it. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get set to receive some mission fuel from today's trailblazer, Mr. Steve Vassar. Enjoy. Steve, welcome to the show, my brother. Thank you for having me, Steven. Appreciate it. So this has been one conversation a long time coming. Sean has definitely been saying, hey, you know, Steve is my right-hand man. Definitely want to hear his story shared on the Trailblazers podcast. And I have a big heart for Sean and and excited. We've been exchanging so much in Twitter over what, like a year (laughs) now, at least, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. And so it's just exciting to be able to have a conversation with you and share your story and your wisdom with the community. So, you know, I know you're a man of God. I know you're a husband. I know you're a father. And, you know, I know you also listen to Trailblazers and, you know, I love to start things off from a place of gratitude. And so I kind of wanted to start this conversation off and ask you to reflect on your life to this point and how you're using this time right now to express and encourage gratitude, both within your family and your community. So that's a great question, Stephen. And again, I want to, you know, in the spirit of gratitude, thank you for the courage to start and continue this podcast. It's no small feat. And I just wish you continued success. And For me, the expression of gratitude emanates from a place that started, as far as I'm concerned, many years ago. 
and continues in having the opportunity, opportunities such as working with the campaign for Black Male Achievement, the opportunity to continue to support my family, to continue to also support the community, whether it's directly with young men, directly with young people who are striving to move forward in their work, and also just giving uh, praise and thanks where it's due to the creator for, again, allowing me the opportunity, little old me, the opportunity to keep putting one foot in front of the other to continue supporting people and supporting this work. It does come from a deep place that was a place of despair and challenge Mm. at one point. And has grown to a place of possibility and faith, a place where, you know, we, the battles are not all ours. Mm -hmm. And so how do we recognize what's ours to fight? How do we put faith where faith needs to be placed and also do work? And so if we do that work from a place of love and gratitude, only good can come even when there are challenges. Yes. So true, man. I appreciate that, Steve. So I know that from reading, I know that you're a man who loves music. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I heard you're actually... I'm just, also grateful to God for having ears, you know, <laughs> and, and being a lover of music. That's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> so I read that you're actually a former DJ. Yes. Yes, I am. Love it. Love it. Radio, nightclubs, parties, wherever there was a need for some music and an opportunity to make money doing it, I was there. And it was both a gift and a curse. But at this stage of life, what I'll say looking back is that it's provided me a deep appreciation for listening. Sometimes not just listening once, sometimes you've got to go back and listen a few times. Mm -hmm. And it's also provided me an opportunity for recordings because one of the things you'll find in life and in performance of music is that the only time you will hear something performed the same way twice is if it was recorded. Other than that, every time someone talks or every time, I mean, even if you say the same line a number of times, it'll be different each time. Something very nuanced about it will be different. Yes. And so anyway, I've appreciated that through my love for music. What's your favorite genre? Well, I have a few, so I can't lock in on one. I will say that reggae, as in dance hall, I'm also, every once in a while, I love a classic, but definitely I'm a dance hall fan along with hip hop. Hip hop is my number one. It's my first, my musical first love. Mm. But hip hop grew out of both the reggae, the dance hall reggae and the disco tradition. So I love hip hop, dance hall, house and an, I'm also a huge R&B fan, but uh, hip hop is my number one because I grew up with hip hop. It spoke for me and for many other folks when it couldn't. And I actually relate to it quite a bit. Can't complain <laughs> with you there, man. <laughs> so what fuel the transition from DJ to what you're doing today? Kind of walk me through that, that path. So there never really was a transition, believe it or not. When I was both in undergrad and then moving into grad school, especially in graduate school, there were these personas. So I had my Clark Kent, my daytime persona, right, where I worked with and on behalf of, you know, the community. And then at night, I had my pseudonym, which shall remain nameless. (laughs) And that was my bizarro Superman persona. And so to be able to live out loud in both places, in both, to have two sort of lifespans going on at the same time was, you know, both exciting and there was a point where it all had to end, where I really did have to transition. And what triggered that, you know, very candidly, what triggered that was the realization that it was too much. I was doing too much. Mm -hmm. When my nighttime escapades were overtaking everything in my daytime life, including my family, Mm. including my day-to-day duties, I realized that I needed to make a change, make a shift, and move from being a DJ into being more of a family man and that kind of thing. And unfortunately, the other piece of this is this, this idea around work, And work really over, you know, there is such a thing, I think, of being addicted to work and being 
beholden and working too much. And I worked so much that it came at the neglect of my family. It came at the peril. And the cost for me was my first marriage ended in divorce. And I fought for a long time for custody of my children. And that worked for a while. I mean, I had, you know, it just cost a lot to do both. And while I'm, you know, grateful again to what music has given me, there's also a painful side of that. And so at any rate, moving through what's been helpful to me has been the ability to focus. I'll also say that God sent me at a time I didn't think that I would be wedded again. I thought I'd be a bachelor forever. And, you know, a man plans and God laughs. Yes, and he so does. God sent me my current wife. And, you know, we have really, I mean, she's been, when I say a true godsend, she and her family fully embraced my daughters and me. Wow. And that, you know, that's not the way that story typically goes, yeah. that a man can come into a relationship with two children and find that his children are loved as much, if not more, than he. And there was a comfort there for me that, you know, made it very clear. So for me, the, a lot of things came together alongside hard work, alongside building a career, continuing to build on a career where I wanted to support, support children, support community, specifically black community and support family. And so all of that brings me to this space I'm in now. So if I've read your bio, I've shared some of that with our community in the opening, but if you and I were sitting down and we're having two red stripes listening to some 90s dance hall, and I'm like, <laughs> Steve, tell me a little bit about yourself. I wouldn't get that scripted pitch. What would you tell me about yourself over those couple beers? How I think I'd tell you that. I think that what I would tell you is that, yeah, that's, that's an amazing question. And I'm going to fish for the real answer, not the good answer. Right. Yeah. And the real answer is is that this guy has gone through some challenges, that I've seen some things. The real answer is that as a former DJ, I've seen some things in the streets that the bow tie won't let you see. Mm. You know, folks see the bow tie. They don't see the guy that carried records, the guy that has seen his share of violence, the guy that's seen and heard his share of of challenges and disruptions and probably created some of them. They won't see, you know, the bow tie and the suit won't show you the guy who worked in the streets putting up posters in the middle of the night so that he could take care of his daughter right. who postponed graduate school for a couple of years, not because he was playing, but because he had to sit out. And that what he learned in that year of sitting out of grad school was as valuable, if not more valuable than what he learned in the graduate school. School of Uh, hard knocks. The hard knocks with life will teach you is what my younger brother says. And so I think that over those red stripes, the stories you would hear are stories of, of both meeting addiction and fighting addiction, whether it was sex, whether it was drugs, whether it was alcohol, whether it was nighttime. You know, I enjoyed, I was a guy that enjoyed nighttime as much as I enjoyed daytime. Like some people will look up in the sky during the day Mm -hmm. and see beauty in that daytime. And I could look up at a night sky and see beauty in that. And so to be able to walk through some of those pieces that I've seen is what you would hear over those red stripes, probably with some share of cussing and with some measure of prayer, because some of what I saw was insane and some of it was profane. But all of it was worthy and all of it brought me to us talking. So I'm appreciative even of those things. Isn't it amazing how that works, though? It is. Yeah, I appreciate it. You wouldn't have thought. No, No, not in that point in time. Definitely not. But it's interesting how God has a way to bring us through those experiences to where we find ourselves now. So now we're here today. What drives you right now to do what you're doing? So what drives me is, you know, for greater than seven years, at least seven years that I've known about the campaign for Black Male Achievement, 
I've wanted to work alongside Sean Dove and Rashid and the team at the campaign. And all of my work between Baltimore and here, I think, and even just a little bit prior, has prepared me for this moment. And what drives me is that we're in a moment, and I think Sean Dove, the CEO of the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, describes this moment as promise versus peril. And what I would add to that moment that we're in is you get what you're looking for. If you're looking for peril, then you will approach this moment as if everything in front of you is perilous. And when you operate from that perspective, everything that you're doing is about prevention. It's about, you know, ensuring that we protect as opposed to looking at this moment as pregnant with promise, Mm. which is what my orientation is. Yes, black men and boys are challenged in the country. I don't want to be Pollyannish. In the U.S. and beyond the U.S., wherever you find black men and boys, you will find challenges. You'll find them in the most challenging scenarios. However, That's not all black men and boys. And furthermore, if we focus on the perilous condition they're in, we won't see the promise that they could be. Right. So what I've been seeking in my career, the place I've been seeking, what keeps me charged is I'm looking for the light. I'm looking for where's the promise? Where's the hope? You know, we can be faithful, but we got to get the work in. So where's the hope and who's doing the work Mm. to really lay the groundwork? We're not going to win in our own lifetime. This is work that's going to, it's generational work. And that's how Sean describes it. I think we're in a generational fight. Um, It took us generations to get here. It will take us generations to get out. And also we have to recognize and what keeps me charged is that this fight for black men and boys, for the lives of black men and boys is actually a fight. This is not a picnic. It is not a march. It is not even a revolution alone. It is all of those things. Plus, and this fight, as I characterize it, is chess fought on several boards at the same time. It's like playing several games of chess at the same time. And it's asymmetric. In other words, Mm. your opponent is using rules you're not aware of. He changes the rules at any given moment. So he's not only capricious, but he's fighting you with any weapon he can put his hands on. It could be policy. It could be a pole that he found somewhere that he brought, like in Charlottesville, when they beat that man, you know, in the garage and they hit him with everything they could find. That is the fight black men and boys are in every day in this country and across the globe. And so that battle, that fight, for me, what energizes me is there are people who are fighting towards the light. They're not fighting for the sake of fighting. They're fighting because they, too, see possibility and promise in black men and boys. And every day they go to work to press that forward. So it's with that energy and, again, with a grateful heart that I come into this work and with deep passion around black men and boys. And certainly we've got a lot to do. And so how can I with this, you know, as the song goes, this little light, how am I able to contribute? And I'm constantly seeking ways to be contributory and to be amongst those who are contributing. So that brings me into and attracts me to and keeps me at the campaign for black male achievement. Love it, man. And you talk about your energy. How do you manage? I'm curious to know how you manage your energy so that you're always full. Yeah. So part of it is reading. It's listening. It's listening to folks like yourself and the leaders you bring out on your podcast. Mm. It's reading information that's out there. It's learning from, you know, there's no way in my lifetime I can either make all the mistakes that people have made (laughs) or achieve all the successes others have made. So for me, I try to stay curious and learn. There's something to learn from everyone if we're willing to listen. And so the question for me that keeps me sort of engaged is, what have you come to teach me today? Mm. Uh, What's here for me to learn? And what happens is if you listen long enough, it will emerge 
in the most unorthodox and sometimes the quietest moment and will just shine brilliantly. And you can't walk away from it. That was the lesson. I was gonna That's ask, what, you know, it came to teach today. Yeah, I was going to ask along that line, are there daily rituals? Are there points of the day where you allow yourself quiet time to think and to be still and to be able to receive kind of the direction that you need to move in each day to win? So each morning, my practice is to be still for a few moments, is to wake with a mindful heart. It's very brief, but very important that I take several deep breaths, that I start very slowly as opposed to hopping out of the bed, which is what I used to do. I would just jump straight out of the bed and go right to it. Now, each day, it's sort of just taking a few moments to, you know, part of it in all candor, Stephen, is I'm getting a little older. So this <laughs> hop out of the bed stuff, you know, I don't know, brother, you know, I got to... Got to stretch a little bit, <laughs> you know, make sure all systems are go, yes. you know, that there are no, no I, warning lights on, you know. <laughs> listen, I, I laugh because I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> but just, just taking a few moments to, yes. to slowly emerge into the day, you know, giving God the glory for the opportunity to open up and know that my toes are still able to get on these on the ground and that I can stand up and all systems are go and that I have yet another day to exercise his will. And so for me, that's just a very, just a very brief moment of reflection, but also a moment of gratefulness for the day. You know, I think, you know, for just a short moment in those moments, allow my mind to sort of range over who's gone ahead of me. Who's going ahead of us to glory and what would they also want to be doing? And also just a moment in that, in that reflection to meditate and think on and pray on health and safety for everyone. The ones that I work with, the ones that I work on behalf of, certainly for my family and friends and extended family. We have family uh, globally, you know, and so for us, it's, you know, just checking in with the universe. So that's a very sort of brief meditation that occurs before my day gets started. And then the other thing that I'll tell you is that throughout the day, whether I'm in meetings or traveling, you know, walking to work, I have the opportunity to be able to walk to work. My nice. um, The office, the distance from the office to my home is about a half a mile. Oh, wow. And so that gives me, you know, a tremendous opportunity to again, take in and get ready for the day of work. Right. I am excited by being here, but also throughout the day, there are moments, there are reflective moments that'll strike me. And if I have the opportunity, I'll stop and allow that moment to do its work. There were, again, I'm fortunate to be in a place where I don't have to, where I don't have to power through Every each and every day, power through a bunch of work. I can actually stop and be reflective or contemplative for a few moments. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a few moments is just a minute. Sometimes it's 10. But it just I have, a you know, those moments are as important as the waking moments Absolutely. because I learn things through those moments. So I'd love to understand what it means to you to climb. So this thank you for that question. The CLIMB for me is is actually an acronym, but it also ties into my life in a couple of different ways. One is literally, as a boy, I climbed trees. Mm. And when I climbed these trees, it, especially in my one of my former neighborhoods, we had apple trees. And what I found as a little boy was that I found refuge the higher up in the tree I could go. I also found that the best fruit didn't tend to be towards the center of the tree, but it tended to be on the ends of limbs, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a metaphor in there relative to those trees. And even as I thought about the next thing I like to climb was rocks. So there was a time when I went rock climbing, ah. you know, and then beyond that, as I moved into being an adult, it occurred to me that I also had climbed a career ladder and that climb in career was more akin to 
rock climbing than it was to climbing a ladder, especially when I came through. I mean, I came through work in the 80s and 90s and now into the 2000s. And in that time, we find in particularly in nonprofit work that there's not as much in the way of loyalty to employees as there was in years past. So in order to advance, at least during my time of climbing from one place to the other, advancement really looked more like rock climbing than it did tree climbing or even ladder climbing. And so what I did was I developed an acronym, and actually it's going to help me as I develop out a book that's going to be focused on this acronym CLIMB. And just allow, if you'll allow me just a sure. couple of minutes, I'll share with you sort of where that acronym takes me and how it relates to, you know, career or how it relates to life unto itself, whether you're, you know, climbing a tree, as I did, to find better fruit mm-hmm. or climbing out of a valley. One of the things I've said to my mentees and also that I say to I share with people who are who really find themselves in the valley. And I'm using quotes that you can't see. But when they find themselves in the valley, I say that, you know, you really there's an opportunity there. There's a calling when you're in the valley. And that calling is that you actually have when you're deep in the valley, you actually have two hills that you can climb. So the question is, which one do you want to take? There are two inclines in a valley. It's like a V. And mm-hmm. if you're in the, the deep part of the V, you now have two inclines towards a peak. So pick one if there's an opportunity and just one step at a time. So when I talk to folk, when I think about climb, the C, as far as I'm concerned, is really about first considering the environment. Mm. Another way to look at to look at that C in the climb is to claim victory. Where do you want to get to? What do you actually want? What does the win look like? And the other thing that comes to me around this C is, you know, you got to check your equipment. Now, I'm going to be very clean with you. And then I'm also going to get just a little bit, you know, as a DJ, I have to get a little edgy with you. <laughs> I when I say it. check your equipment, I would say check your mind check your body and check your spirit. Because when you start to ascend, you need all three to move forward. Now, another way to say that would be to to check your gut and to also check your testicular fortitude. Because I know it's a family show. I'm going to keep it clean. (laughs) But, you know, check yourself to make sure that you're ready for the climb. The L as far as I'm concerned, there are lots of L's in here. You know, the other piece of this is check your luggage. What are you bringing on this climb with you? What is holding you back? What can you shed in that luggage? What are you carrying? Whether it's pain, whether it's bad feelings, understand what's going with you because that's going to become important the higher you go. The other L's that come to me are, you know, let's go. Like, let's get it. Let's get up this thing. Whether it's a hill that moves us out of depression, whether it's moving up this tree towards the fruit, whether it's moving towards that promotion you want, at some point you've got to leap. At some point you've got to lift off. You can't just stand there and consider this climb. You've got to actually do something. So let's go. Let's get it. And then in terms of the I, there is going to be an incline. And so you got to get ready for the work relative to that incline. There's also an invitation within that climb. And I, and one of the things I love about the eye is that it's in the center mm-hmm. piece of this. Mm-hmm. So what's the invitation? What's calling you? What's that invocation? What's calling you to do this? And be very clear about that, because, again, going back to the sea, when you get there's going to come a point in the climb where you're going to be like, holy hell, how did I get up here? And why did I do this again? So just remembering that invitation and also being prepared for the incline. There's going to be a part where it gets tough. That takes me into the M in the climb, which is to motivate. You got to remember, again, why and also tap into your why. But be mindful when we're thinking about careers. You know, some people think about a career as a straight road up. You know, I can start as an associate and then maybe they'll let me be a coordinator. And then if I do well, maybe they'll let me be a manager, 
a director, and soon enough they'll give me keys and I'm the boss. You got to be, I think, clear about the idea that, uh, clear about what your ultimate motivation is, which may not be money. It may not be upwards mobility. It may simply be that you are looking for the Venn diagram that says that intersects doing good with doing well. So being mindful and also being willing to measure, knowing that, you know, 10 years ago or actually for me now, 17 years ago, I left graduate school and I kept moving down this trajectory. I didn't know that 17 years later I would be working with the campaign for Black Male Achievement, which for me is a pinnacle in my own experience. It is where the intersection of the Venn diagram lives for me. So being mindful and measuring your own journey. And and lastly, this flows, this B, the B in the climb, as far as I'm concerned, is you've got to believe. And when you arrive, when you win, stop and behold. Yes. Look around. Celebrate the fact that, you know, you made it. Folks, I don't know, but I, I sometimes worry about our colleagues who... When they have won, they're looking for like this huge parade. They're looking for like some kind of fanfare and and a proclamation that you've won, right? <laughs> Maybe even a trophy. The fact of the matter is my first $10,000 check came into my mailbox really quietly. The postal worker was tired and sweaty. It was a hot day. He was not singing my praises or blowing a horn because he put a check in my inbox. It didn't happen like that. It was real quiet. It was dusty. You know, it didn't occur that way. And actually, when you think about the times that you've won in life, they tend to be very quiet moments. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm inviting listeners to do is when you've won, when you've climbed to where you want to be, Don't complain because now that you climb to the top, all you see is more hills, but behold the hills and decide what your next climb is going to be. So how do you suggest that the listeners climb their ladders, their rocks and trees and the personal professional problems and possibilities that we face? I mean, how I think that they should do it is literally to consider what's in front of them. Again, as I share with you, to claim the victory. Yeah. You know, to say, like, this is where we're headed. And then I want them to be encouraged in taking that first step and lifting off, to actually leap, to move towards where they want to be, to recognize that this climb that they're going to be on is on an incline. It's not a flat hill. It goes uphill. Sometimes it looks like a hockey stick, meaning that you're going to start at you're going to start with a very short you know, runway and then you're going straight up into the sky. But there will be an end. Cl- they have to recognize that. I want them to be mindful in all that they do, but also be motivated. And lastly, when they win, <laughs> I want them, first of all, I want folks to believe they're going to win, uh-huh. but also to behold the win and to really contemplate and just behold and be with that win. So the climb, as far as I'm concerned, how they're going to do that really is to commit commit to actually moving. The thing I love about the word crime is there's movement. It's not just a noun, it's no. a verb. Yeah. You've got to move, You've got to do something. You got to put one foot in front of the other. And that doesn't necessarily mean I don't want to leave out my brothers and sisters who are, who aren't physically able to move because frankly, this could apply to anyone who has the mindset. I, I was just going to um, say that. that. I think this is so want- much more mental than it is physical. That's right. It is mental because, you know, if you've talked to an able-bodied person who has received the shock of their life, it's difficult. Their body freezes up. When someone is, is in shock, they can't move. They're stuck. And so it's not about physical as much as it's about, okay, we got to check the systems. We got to consider, check our equipment. You know, do we have the guts? Do we have the intestinal fortitude and the, for <clears throat> men, the testicular fortitude mm-hmm. to move forward? Do we know what the victory is? Like, you know, as a person who might have come, who might be working through addiction, they say one day at a time, one day at a time. So today I'm going to do the best I can. They're claiming victory for today before they even start or with that Covey principle, um, 
they're starting with the end in mind, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I don't think it's, I think what's profound and what I've appreciated about my own, what I've found in my own life and in observation of others is they have all climbed their way out, in, through, around, over, under, (laughs) all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And have gone to the win and the folks who are most, not just most successful, but also happiest have taken a moment to do, to really focus on and celebrate the wins, not just claim victory, but celebrate their wins. That's a whole other C. I'm going to have to write that down, brother. (laughs) See, you just inspired me to write another one down. There you go. You know, but to go back and celebrate the wins is so important and recognize that you know, your wins are not going to be, they may not, some of them do come with, you know, huge pronouncements and a parade and the world stops and says, thank you. But but for most of us, it's very quiet. It doesn't happen that way. Pat yourself on the shoulder and keep chugging on. Keep chugging. That's right. You know, I listened to the acronym and I, I love, love, love all these pieces, by the way. And, you know, as I said to you, you know, about the mental just now, you've heard me share my testimony on the podcast, you know, I've been through the worst of financial strife and business struggle three weeks into marriage, losing several million dollars and starting out a marriage below zero. And I'm listening to a lot of the pieces that you've put into Climb and I can relate, man. I mean, you know, the thing I love is being able to measure, you know, and there are several things, you know, but I think sometimes mm-hmm. it's like, you know, uh, working so hard to get out of a valley and we don't stop to mm-hmm. recognize sometimes, right, how far mm-hmm. we've gotten up that hill, right? Like you're still looking at, oh, you know, I still have so much of this hill to get to the peak, but it's like, take a mm-hmm. pause and breathe for a second and look up, look at how far you've come from it, right? Sometimes we don't, we don't take mm-hmm. that pause to realize like, yo, you know, we are progressing and to yeah. give ourselves that pat on the back, you know, and to believe that we can continue on from there to get to yeah. the point we're chasing, right? And the luggage piece too, man, because <laughs> if you're in that valley with a whole heap of luggage, you ain't going nowhere, you know, you can't pull that weight up the hill. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I will tell you what the... You know, there's also something scary in the measure. In in talking about the measure, there is something scary about looking down and looking back. Mm -hmm. It calls up a lot of questions. What did I leave behind? Who did I leave behind? Did I forget somebody or something along the way? Did you need to Um, forget somebody or something? I mean, sometimes that's, (laughs) that's what it takes sometimes to be able to go up the hill. You have to be able to unload some of that, right? That's right. That's exactly right. And so I just, uh, I appreciate you uh, bringing that because you're reminding me that sometimes in the climb, when the climb gets toughest, so I love to go up. I'm always concerned about the fall. Mm -hmm. And I'm concerned about the fall from an honest place. When I was five, my mother reminded me that I fell out of a tree and I broke my arm. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember breaking my arm. I have no recollection of it, which means I fell and I blacked out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was such a terrific fall that I don't remember it. And I have waking memories of a lot of other things, but not that. But the idea of looking down and seeing the contemplating the distance between where I am and from where I came can be scary. However, it goes back to the belief portion, which is you've got to believe that there's a net that you can't see. And that calls into, it doesn't call into question our faith, it tests our faith, that there's a net, that you'll be all right. Even if you fall and break everything, you will be all right. And I think that that takes, uh, you know, maybe I'm being foolish, maybe I got great insurance, maybe I'm tied to 150 different rope. I don't know, but I tell you what, when I am in the faith walk fully, I don't contemplate and don't lose sight of, I don't lose sight of the ground. And I appreciate being able to not lose sight of the ground, but still know that I'm going to be okay if something goes awry. I believe that it's going to work out. And we've got to have that that conviction, that belief at our core as well. Very true. 
And I mean, worst case scenario, end up back in the valley or in and you, you start climbing again. I mean, That's you have it. to be able to embrace because you already knew what the valley was. So let's continue to move towards that next. I really believe that I'm getting more comfortable with being uncomfortable and being able to mm. push myself, you know, outside of these comfort zones and mm. being able to climb, you know, and I love this, man. <laughs> I will be, I will be <laughs> definitely one of the first people in line looking forward to that book. I'm excited to learn more. So let's turn and talk about something else here. I know you're the director of Rumble today. And yes. <laughs> let's talk about Rumble a little bit. And I'm curious to know, you know, what with Rumble, what are you teaching young black men today about masculinity and what it means to be a man? So Rumble, Young Man Rumble is the premier gathering of leaders in black male achievement. And those leaders can be young men, young black men and boys, Mm -hmm. as well as adults, adult men and women of all stripes, faith, race, creed, color, credo. As long as they're supporting young black men and boys, we offer Rumble to them. And I would say to you that In terms of black men and boys and masculinity, the lessons that they're learning that I would hope that they're picking up is, and I'm just going to borrow Sean Dove's word, that vulnerability is the new sexy, right? That it's important for you to know as early as you can where you're strong and to also know and acknowledge where you're not strong. Our hero, our inspiration for Rumble, young man, Rumble, is Muhammad Ali. Yes. Muhammad Ali started boxing when he was 12 years old because somebody stole his bike. And he's like, I'm going to go fight him. And the guy, he, the policeman that he ran across said, well, if you're going to go fight somebody, I think you need to learn how to fight. Because mm. <laughs> whoever took your bike, you know, probably knows how to fight. So Muhammad Ali channeled his angst into boxing, became a Golden Gloves champ. And then certainly most of what we know about Muhammad Ali happened before that man was 25 years old. And many people don't realize that. Wow. Wow. You know, and so what that means is that like everything we know about him from the standpoint of his championships, that kind of thing, most of that happened by the time he was 25. And so When you look at it through those eyes, the question about masculinity, the question about what we hope young men will pick up is that this journey is not linear. The journey to manhood is not linear. And it's also not driven by what's beneath your waist and your underwear. It's driven by so much more and that that young man is so much more. And the sooner he recognizes and taps into that, the sooner he begins his leadership walk and the sooner he also recognizes that, you know, he's got purpose. Yes. And, and so for us to ignite purpose is one of the goals in Rumble around young black men and boys who are attending. This idea of masculinity as well is frankly something we're going to have to examine with young men who are coming of age in a moment when you have young women who are saying they're masculine. Who are clearly showing masculinity when gender has become, you know, a construct that has been determined to be fluid. And so, you know, that's something that I think we'll have to both provide information into as a community of people that care about black men and boys, but also we'll have to learn because we do have sisters who consider themselves masculine and we want to honor them and that energy and also ensure that that energy is kept safe while also ensuring that males who are born males are also allowed to live and achieve their life outcomes. I mean, at the end of the day, we really want to ensure the regeneration and the support of black men and boys in this country and beyond. And you've got to do that, ensuring that we are honoring both that masculine energy, but even beyond the masculine energy, also honoring feminine energy even if it shows up in a male body and when, not just if, when it shows up in a male body. So that's, you know, there are a number of nuances there. I think for us, we're in the posture of both getting information and giving information, getting support and giving support, 
getting a community together and giving these young men a community that they can live into and regenerate and grow. I hope that makes sense. There's so much in that question, but so much also that there's a lot of work to do. And it's very real and very important. And it's imperative work to, you know, the at least in the colonized world, the colonies, America included, were built off of black male and black female labor and blood and sweat and tears Mm -hmm. and free. The wealth of America is built off of free labor. And so as goes black men and boys, so goes America and so goes the colonies, British, you know, Portuguese, on and on and on. So it's important that we do this work and, again, recognize and support black men and boys, but also recognize and support black women and girls in a wider view. Appreciate that, brother. Listen, I could talk to you for the rest of the night, man. (laughs) Wow. We're approaching the hour, so I want to be respectful of the time that we have left with you. And I know our Trailblazer community won't be happy if I let you off the call without being able to tap into some of your resources and tools. So one of the questions that our community loves to be able to engage with you on is to have you maybe share a book or a couple books that you've read that you really enjoy and you can't stop recommending. (laughs) <laughs> so I will say one of my most recent favorites is actually a little revolutionary. So I'm going to be I'm going to be a little counter and I'm going to say to you one of my more recent favorites is the handbook of guerrilla warfare. And that's by Kwame Nkrumah. I would absolutely encourage folks to look at that. And it's actually it runs counter. I also love The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Mm mm-hmm. I think that in this moment, as I'm looking towards the power of promise and possibility, I also pay attention to power moves. Mm. So I think that Sun Tzu, the uh, art of war, is one. Also, I would encourage our listeners to a third book that I think has entered my life very recently, thanks to Sean Dove. And it's a relatively... It's not an easy book to get your hands on unless you contact Sean. I'm joking when I say this, but uh, I think it's I know a, what a book called about. Turnaround. Yes, Turnaround, the Turnaround CEO. CEO. <laughs> yes, the nuggets in that book. Good if wisdom, I could just right? underline it, yeah. there's a lot of wisdom in that book. Yeah. I think I think that's a good one. There's not one favorite. There are. I really I keep four or five in rotation, nice. and I revisit them in rotation that's great i'll say that that's those are the ones that i would recommend i love it i love it so last question of the night what's the one action that our trailblazer community coming off this call should take this week to help them blaze their trail i would say that whatever you do this week i would ask you to listen deeply i invite you to when i say listen i mean that Whatever your habit is, listen deeply to to what's going on around you. Listen to what your get quiet within yourself and hear what people are saying to you. Hear what's going on around you. Hear what others are, are saying and not saying as they're with you. And hopefully in all of that listening, you will find the inspiration that you need. You'll find the energy you need. You'll find the fuel you need to keep going forward, to keep blazing trails. Love it, my brother. Listen, Steve, I am so grateful that you shared some time with us and your wisdom. Just can't thank you enough, man. Tell us, before we wrap up, tell us, I know you're a, a guy that loves to engage on Twitter, but tell us how we can stay connected with you, whether on Twitter or elsewhere. And then we can go ahead and wrap up for today. Oh, man. So listen, I'm on Twitter. You can. And it's all confusing, but I'm on Twitter, brother. (laughs) If you want to catch me, that's where I'm going to be all day, every day. And I'm at C Vassor on Twitter. I am on Instagram. I have a pseudonym on Instagram, you know, and but it's called at Bowtied and Black on Instagram. And so you'll I don't know what you'll find there, but good luck. That's where you'll find me. (laughs) Uh, I am not on Facebook. 
And you can also find me at your nearest record shop or used bookstore looking for gems and jewels. That's where I am. (laughs) Love love it. (laughs) Steve Assar, thank you so much, my brother. Thank you, Steve. And I really appreciate this opportunity. And thank you to the community for everything you all are doing. Thank you, Stephen, for bringing this community together. Much love. Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Trailblazers podcast. I'll be posting links to all of today's book recommendations and links mentioned on our show notes page at tdpod.com. If today was your first time listening to the Trailblazers podcast, I just want to extend a warm Trailblazers welcome to you. We're so happy to have you here and we encourage you to go ahead and hit that subscribe button in your favorite podcast app. Go ahead and browse through some of our past episodes to keep the knowledge flowing. If you're a fan of the podcast and today's content, and you're maybe already subscribed to the podcast, please continue to share and invite your friends, your family, your colleagues to listen to an episode that you think might impact them most. We believe that someone listening to these inspiring stories will be moved to make significant changes that will have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. Don't miss next week's episode. New episodes are released each and every Monday by about 5 a.m. Eastern. Trailblazers, jump off this podcast today. Go find a way to rise above, go way beyond, and keep blazing your trail. Cheers. Cheers.